All right, welcome to Life on the Rock tonight. Doug Berry and myself, we'd like to welcome you and our guest, Thomas Peters. It's going to be a fantastic show tonight. He, is, uh, he writes the American Papist blog. He's out there in the new media, in the blogosphere. He's blogging away in, in defense of the Catholic faith. And he's the ripe old age of 25, 25 years old. He's out yeah. there. And he's been and blogging for, I think, 18 years, he said. Has he really? <laughs> it's a quality blog. He's been, seven. he's been on the major networks like Fox News, CNN, MSNBC, uh, just all the big media outlets. He's been interviewed for different things, so we're thrilled to have him with us tonight. Yeah. Now, Doug, you have a shirt on. Tell a us new about shirt, that. a new gift. Thank you very much. Anne Marie Altomer. Altomer? Altomer? Anne Marie Altimer <laughs> from Ardmore, Pennsylvania. This is a shirt, Regina Angelorum Academy. A nice tight shot of that there insignia. The Regina Angelorum Academy. It's fantastic. What would that be? Angelorum is angels. Regina, of course, Our Lady. Academy of Angels, Our Lady of the Angels. Our Lady of the Angels, or Queen of the Angels. Queen yeah. of the Angels, mm -hmm. Regina. Oh, there you go. Thank you very much, Anne Marie, for this fantastic shirt. And God bless you and your academy out there at Ardmore, Pennsylvania. And we wear this on Life on the Rock. It look, almost looks like a military shirt, doesn't it? It does. It fits okay. you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> military haircut. Well, tonight we're going to be speaking about uh, social communications media. And this is a particularly relevant for young people because you guys out there, you live and breathe this stuff. You speak the language. And it's vital. It's vital in this day and age in evangelization and spreading the gospel to use all the forms of media that we can. This is what the Catechism says about the use of social communications media. It says, within modern society, the communications media play a major role in information, cultural promotion, and formation. This role is increasing as a result of technological progress, the extent and diversity of the news transmitted, and the influence exercised on public opinion. Right? This is a vital way to promote, to form culture. And right, as, as Christians, as baptized Christians, we need to be out there forming the culture. And I want to address as well that young people, you are out there on the front lines. And our Holy Father recognized this. Last year at the World Communications Day, he addressed young people in particular about this. He said, I would like to conclude this message by addressing myself in particular to young Catholic believers to encourage them to bring the witness of their faith to the digital world. Dear brothers and sisters, I ask you to introduce into the culture of this new environment of communications and information technology the values on which you have built your lives. And he goes, says some other things. He says, it falls in particular to young people who have an almost spontaneous affinity for the new means of communication to take on the responsibility for the evangelization of this digital continent, meaning this whole digital world, you know, that we can interact. That's a, the digital <laughs> continent. Yeah. What a great term. That is. That's big. You but know? You know, there's a lot of parents out there, and I've run into this over the years, who want to kind of pull their kids back from technology and, and, mm -hmm. and media and so forth. And to a point, I understand that because a fair amount of what's out there is either senseless or dangerous, poisonous even. However, because it is so much a f part of our fiber, uh, even the Pope is saying we cannot avoid necessarily the technological advances that we have. We need to get in there and use them for the right reasons. Right. We need to get in there and be active. You know, you think of John Paul the Great University out in San Diego that's uh, trying to do that, that very thing. That very thing. So you know, don't necessarily you know pull your kids away and try to hide them from this. I wouldn't. I would recommend that. I mean, my five kids, we don't hide them from it. They understand what a TV is. We monitor right. it. Right. We teach properly with it. Right. But the other forms, I mean, video and and and, uh, and internet. Uh, Proper use of it can be a tremendous source of getting that word out at, at evangelization. And it, it can serve, like, our humanity, it can serve the dignity, you know, of man in such a beautiful way. It can help us to stay connected to one another, to foster communication, to mm -hmm. foster friendship, you know, to share resources, to support one another. You know, I, you know, I know as a person out there, as a missionary, I'm a Franciscan missionary, it's always encouraging for me to see other people working in the vineyard, mm. right? And through this, this new forms of communication, we can stay very connected, we can help one another, share resources, initiatives, projects, whatever it is. And I'm always amazed, you know, maybe it shows my age, but every time I get online, how much information is out there and how much uh. is at our fingertips you know, to engage the culture. Which is what we're going to be discussing tonight, obviously, with our guests, is how fast information can be put out to the entire world. 
you know, in, in, a, in just a moment, in a heartbeat. But this is something even St. Maximilian Kolbe was adamant. St. Maximilian Kolbe was adamant about using the modern means at his time necessary. It was necessary, he saw it as, you know, to evangelize, to get the word out. All in moderation, of course. Don't let this be an excuse for your kid to be texting, you know, 400 times a day. I mean, there has to be a good purpose and a good reason behind it. Right, right. But you're right. You can. Yeah. Quick contact with somebody once in a while can yeah. be an encouragement, can be uplifting and uh, help yeah. spread the light of Christ. So we're going to take a quick break. and We'll be back with Thomas Peters. He's the blogger who runs the American Papist uh, blog site. So don't go away. We'll be right back in a minute. Hi, welcome back to Life on the Rock. Tonight, our guest is Thomas Peters from the American Papist. Welcome. Good to see you, Father Mark. And uh, can you tell us about your title? How did you choose that, the American Papist? Well, first of all, it is pronounced Papist. I've been called the American Papist, the American Papist. <laughs> um, it's just, it's, it's, um, it's often pronounced in different ways. Yeah. Papist was a term used um, during Reformation England as a derogatory term to describe Catholics. Papist means someone who follows the Pope. Um, I chose it because I kind of like the idea of retaking the word because I think there's nothing to be ashamed of if you follow the Pope because the Pope follows Christ. Mm -hmm. So I consider myself the American Papist and my readers are American Papists. Right. Well, can you describe, maybe some of our audience aren't a little rusty with the internet. Can you describe us what a blog is and what is it that you do on your website? Sure. Some of our audience doesn't, doesn't have a computer. <laughs> well, <Sorry>. um, <laughs> It's amazing to me. I know, I mean, <laughs> Generation Y or whatever I am, we, we seem to have like every new excuse for something that, you know, has, involves wires. A blog is a frequently updated website. So I will post three or four stories a day, and they just kind of sequence down on a web page. Um, there's only uh, one step to publishing a new story, me. So I just get on my computer, and I write a story, and it shows up on the Internet five seconds later. So one of the nice things about a blog is that I can talk about current issues as they're happening. And um, the other nice feature about a blog is it's got a comment section. So people who are reading the blog can jump into the comments and leave their own response to what I'm saying. And so on the one hand, I've got my story. On the other side, the readers become part of a conversation. And oftentimes, like when I'm reading the comments, I'll learn more about the story I'm talking about. So it's a, it's a two-way conversation that's done on the World Wide Web. And it's, it's great because today we have so much access to such to so many people. Anybody can, can do this and we can, like how many hits do you have in your blog a, a day? I'd say depending, day? like if I'm breaking a, a large story, about ten or 15,000 a day. And mm -hmm. there's also um, American Papist uh, Facebook and Twitter communities. Facebook mm -hmm. is a website for uh, people and friends to stay in touch. And Twitter is sort of like an online news service. And mm -hmm. so through those various social networks, people can find um, the truth as the church has taught it to me. You know what I found interesting too, going to your website is, uh, you know, the links you have and the different articles you find. You know, it, it saves us a lot of time from having to do that research ourselves. You yeah. know, we can find key things being said and done, uh, and get right to the meat of it. Right. Uh, People have called me called the website the Catholic Drudge Report, who mm -hmm. specializes just in finding all the most important news stories of the day, and you know putting it in one place for people. But we should, that's an interesting point because like the Drudge Report is very dry. It's almost like Courier font. You know, you yeah. click on these things. Hopefully I'm not that dry. <laughs> I know. I think you represent like what we're talking about in that first part. Uh, a young person who's very uh, good, you know, very, um, you know, you can use this media and make it look hip and... Well, the and, faith is exciting. Yeah, right. I mean, it's true. And I think that's, that's the best sort of high to have. So, you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's all part of it. Well, if you think, I mean, some of the early media of the Catholic faith was um, stained glass windows. Right. I mean, sculptures. I mean, you go back, you know, a thousand years ago and you had artists who, with their creativity and their imagination, were bringing the faith to life through um, famous paintings and through, through famous sculptures and such. And, and, you know, granted, this is a, a, a unique and different way, but Photoshop's pretty powerful. If you get in there and know how yeah. to use it right, you can do some great things and post it on a site and make your site look alive and... And that does reach people. It speaks mm -hmm. to people, just like stained glass windows. 
used to and still do. I absolutely agree. Like well, one of the videos that I've promoted recently was done by Grassroots Films, and they mm -hmm. did an election video for us a couple years ago. And these these gentlemen are incredibly talented. They both they all have very strong you know personal spiritual lives. Um, but they've got Fox and you know documentary companies coming to them asking them you know to create a media for them because they're just good at what they do because they're passionate about it. So mm -hmm. I, I I agree. Catholics mm -hmm. are no stranger to the cutting edge. Right. Now, how did you get into blogging? How did you find your way? Partially through boredom, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, I was in uh, graduate school uh, doing studies in theology, and I was working in the library. And I had a lot of time in front of a computer with an Internet connection, so I was reading about things that interest me most, so Catholic news, Catholic theology, as it's being debated today. And I thought to myself, well, I can do that too. And especially, I, I noticed that there wasn't yet, I thought, enough young people um, involved in the same debates um, because mm -hmm. there's, you know, there's all these Catholic kids who are in school and busy and starting jobs, and I wanted to provide a way for them to also get their feet wet in the kind of current debate of Catholic ideas, both inside the church and the debate between the church and the outside world. So I thought that was one area where I could kind of contribute to it, and it just gradually snowballed from there. Um, yeah. Would you be able to help uh, the audience understand a bit more about blogging and blog, I mean, it, to some it's just very foreign, right. you know, and kind of where, where it came from and kind of, and then there's, then we have vlogs too, don't we? Video yeah, logs. We have video stuff. logs. So. I mean, I think one of the nice things is that blogging is actually several years old now. It's a, it's a lot more accessible than it used to be. Just like if you want to go search for something on the internet, you might type in google.com. Well, if you type in americanpapist.com, you will come directly to my website and one of the things that might be useful is I think my blog can become a stepping point to other good websites because as you scroll down and look at my news stories, I will you know, hyperlink, I will underline um, certain you know, important topics, and then people can jump to other places. I, on the side of the blog, I have what's called a blog roll, which is where I list the favorite blogs that I'm reading pretty much every day. So you can yeah. just like dip your toe in the water, and once you start reading one kind of good Catholic blog, I'm going to call my own blog a good mm. one, um, you'll find other ones because yeah. there's a, a, a Catholics tend to find like tight knit communities of people who are right. you know equally on fire for the faith. Right. What, what does blog mean? A blog means a web log, and a vlog, a v l o g, is, a, is short for a video log. But I think the way to think about it best is it's a website that updates frequently. So it's like an article you write on a website, and you can have, the neat thing too is these comments, I always find, now do you have, you filter through what people write in and decide what to post as comments, right? I do, yeah. I do. Luckily now I have some help. Um, since I, I changed a little bit about how I organize my comments in January of this year, and since then we've had uh, over 15,000 individual comments. So I've read several books full of just comments of people who have responded oh, to my stories. Oh. What, what do you take from that? Is there a I think, I t well, I take from that that people really care about the sort of issues I'm talking mm -hmm. about. I talk a lot about the dignity of the human person, especially um, unborn human life. I talk about traditional marriage. I also talk about misconceptions about the church. Um, and that's a conversation that I think everyone has a stake in. You know, we're all a baby at one point. Many of us are, have discerning vocations to marriage. And if we're Catholic, we've undoubtedly come into a, a situation where people have attacked us, who have attacked our faith, without right. knowing what we actually believe. Right. And so that's one of the things that I think really inspires a lot of comments because, you know, when someone's in the grocery store and they say, like, are all those kids yours? And then right. you think it's just second nature because you believe this is what, you know, Christ wants, you know, the family's vocation to be lived out if, if that's their, you know, if they're able to have many kids. But you often don't get a chance in that supermarket aisle to explain why. A Catholic blog is a place where you can begin to hear what other people have to say, educate yourself, and you'll also meet people in my comment box who aren't Catholics, and so you get a chance right. to kind of debate that. Thomas, would you work with me on something? Because I've, I have t five children, and, and to some that's not very many. In fact, one priest said to me, well, you're, it's a good start. Right. Um, <laughs> Small Catholic family. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, but you know, that's all the Lord has blessed us with at this point. However, I have run into that, oh, all these kids, yours. My response is normally, yes, where are yours at? Right. 
Um, That's which good. Sometimes they take <laughs> offense to you. But I'd like to create little pamphlets or tracks of some sort where we could hand them out and just have Catholics have little tracks in their pockets ready right. to go when those questions come up. And are they, all these kids yours? Yes. And here's something on the dignity of the human person and right. being open to life. And it might be a fun way to do it, but uh, something to think about how to respond to those things. That's a good just idea. a little side well, note there, ladies and gentlemen. Well, that's a point. I use a lot of humor on your blog. You have captioned pictures and things like yep. that. One of, one of my, just to explain to the, the viewers, one of my favorite ongoing series is I take a, a, it's called the Papist Picture of the Day. And I take a picture of Pope Benedict or something happening in the Vatican, and I include a funny caption to it. And then I invite uh, my readers to come in and, you know, include their own funny captions. Right. So right. I think it's just part of my personality, like how I grew up. Um, yeah. But I think it, again, in a, in a little subtle way, I mean, every time a Catholic is being himself or herself and their best self, that's a witness. Yeah. And so I think when people read the blog and they hear me talking about, you know, the Latin mass and transubstantiation and things that look very arcane and even like from the Middle Ages, and then I can throw in a really good joke, too. They realize that Catholics are normal people who have like extraordinary sources of inspiration in their lives. And extraordinary senses of humor, too, at times. Yeah, well, like you. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. And we didn't even plan for him to say that. God bless you, Thomas. <laughs> and what I, I like, and we've, we've been hitting this theme a lot, but I know, like, when I go to World Youth Days and things, it always, like, charges me up. I feel inspired to see young people, you know, receiving the gospel, having it resonate in them. And I think our secular culture thinks the Catholic Church is a thing of the past, mm -hmm. and they have this very kind of archaic view of the church. And they, sure. But the church is ever new, right? The gospel is ever being appropriated, applied to the culture, and lived out in different ways, right, in every, in every age. And I, right. I think you all witness to that. I think the yeah. world's missing out. Yeah. You know, I mean, I was blessed in college um, to have a really vibrant community of young Catholics who are, in, in, you know, passionate about their faith. And it's such a confirmation of everything you already know to be true to see that, you know, if you're living your faith, you have, you know, you have, you have a, a source of, you know, unassailable happiness. And one of the things that's good about the web and about what I've been able to do in my blog is that, you know, Catholic, you know, young Catholics who don't necessarily have that experience in their lives, maybe they're going to a secular college, you know, maybe they have to work a lot and, you know, at their workplace no one else is Catholic. It's a way of them to, again, connect with the community of Catholics outside of where they might be in their physical circumstances and see that they're not so weird for loving the Pope to start with. And that, that is so vital. I mean, we, we have to be connected to other believers. There's a great fellowship. We, we have the Holy Spirit. We're connected in the mystical body of Christ. The Internet and these kind of things uh, uh, can unite us and strengthen us. I, I, I always say, you know, when we got, went out to California for the pro-life march in San Francisco, I was like shocked to see this vibrant Catholic community out there. I'd bought the lie, you know, the media mm -hmm. presents that, you know, the West Coast is given over to the left, you know. Right. And, um, and to go out and see that, that community was so invigorating. Well, let's talk about your education. You've, you're well educated. What, what degrees do you have? Well, it started, uh, the foundation was laid by my long sacrificing parents. I was homeschooled through high school um, by both my mother and my father. And then I went to Catholic College. I went to Ave Maria College in, when it was in Michigan and did a, a bachelor's there. Mm -hmm. And then I did a master's uh, at Sacred Heart Major Seminary in Detroit. I had two majors there. I studied uh, moral theology and biblical studies. And then uh, just last spring, I graduated with an STB, which is a Sacred Theology Baccalaureate. It's a fancy master's degree for people who want to go on and be a theology teacher. Mm -hmm. That's STB. STB. B. Important to hit the B. B. <laughs> Got it. Okay. <laughs> and, um, uh, and that was just in general theology. And mm -hmm. the last year or so, I've kind of taken off from my studies to work in politics in Washington, D.C. But throughout that entire time... Um, I think my blogging was served, I know that my blogging and writing was so well served by that foundation in Catholic theology. Um, it gives you a confidence to go into debating something or to see like, you know, a, problem, a problematic situation in the church, to have that sense of history mm -hmm. and to have that, re, you know, real, that as uh, I studied a lot of St. Thomas Aquinas and the, the Dominicans have the idea that you study theology on your knees. It's not just something you do with your mind, mm -hmm. it's something you do with your heart and your whole person. Well, that's the kind of person I wanted to form. Right. So it's been... It's Leads been, you to contemplation. Yeah, I'm living proof that you can get a theology degree and still be employable, too. <laughs> yeah, well, tell us more about that. You work for Robert George. That's right. What do you do for him? I work for Robert mm -hmm. George, who a lot of people probably know because he's one of the authors of the Manhattan Declaration, mm -hmm. which is a call to Christian arms to support life, 
family, and religious liberty. Well, I work for Robbie George at an organization called the American Principles Project, and through that organization I do pro-life, pro-family work on Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C. And um, it's, a very, it's a very trying time to be in, he, in politics. He, it's turbulent. And he's, he's one of the most eloquent voices for defense of marriage and the, the pro-life voice in this country. So great, great. He's brilliant, with. and he's a good mentor, too. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us, uh, maybe we get into a little politics here, that what is... No boy. <laughs> what has been, bring us up to date, what's been President Obama's track record in regards to pro-life? Well, I think he has a very problematic relationship with the social teachings of the church. Um, that was a nice way of putting it. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying, I'm, trying to be, I'm trying to be careful and, and charitable. You and I are a little bit different in the way we would approach these things. <laughs> well, it's <laughs> problematic. <laughs> He's part of the culture of death. I've, been in, I've, probably, I've probably been in Washington, D.C. too long. I'm a little bit too, too used to measuring my words. He's not a friend of unborn human life because he doesn't believe that it's worthy of dignity and worthy of protection. And from that perspective, he, you know, I think once, if you can't get human life at all of its stages right, then you have a skewered perspective on what human dignity com comprises of in the rest of uh, development. He also doesn't believe, as Catholics and as reasonable people should, that um, marriage is between one man and one wo woman. Even though he's not in favor of same-sex marriage, he is all but that. Mm -hmm. um, and he also has some very interesting ways with how he thinks he should spend our money. And the Catholic social teaching has a wonderful, you know, treasure trove of knowledge for how society should be justly conducted. And one of the principles is subsidiarity which basically says that people who are closer to a problem are probably better at fixing it than people who are farther away. Mm -hmm. And one of the ideological, political differences that I have with the president that comes, I believe, from my Catholic faith and upbringing is his idea that government should be doing things that I believe that private individuals and even charitable organizations such as the church should be doing first and allowed to do it mm -hmm. when, you know, in their freedom, in their religious freedom and, and sovereignty. Mm -hmm. So we have, a, we have a dialogue going on right now in the church about how to implement Catholic social teaching, you know, in the, in the everyday details. There was a lot of fight in the health care debate about abortion and funding for abortion and all those sorts of things. So I, one of the things that I've come to realize is that Catholics have, you know, a sense of the human person that informs politics positively. So one of the things I'm trying to encourage is for more Catholics to inform themselves about politics, to get involved, and to let their Catholic voice be heard because it's a needed voice in our you know, political discourse. Amen to that. So we're going to take a quick break, and we'll be back in a minute. Hi, welcome back to Life on the Rock. We have Thomas Peters from the American Papist. Uh, tell us about uh, how young people can get involved with the social media. Well, and bear witness. As, as you brought up with the Pope Benedict's um, uh, communication for World uh, Communications Day, you know, young people my own age and younger already live in this environment. I mean, they're, they're watching videos on the website YouTube. You know, they have a Facebook or a MySpace account. And, you know, there's really simple ways that you can be a witness in those circumstances. Like, for instance, one of the things that people will do on Facebook is they'll just post what they're doing right now. I'm first day of school, kind of excited or depressed. Mm -hmm. um, they'll say, you know, going to this concert, really excited. Well, I think for a lot of kids, they'll forget, they'll just kind of delete their, their Catholic things that they're doing. So just even thinking about saying, you know, just came back from Mass, best mm -hmm. thing I did all week. You know, I think sometimes in our culture, which doesn't give religion its same position as other things, um, just being proudly Catholic and figuring out, like, you know, if some friends ask you, like, what's, what's, which church do you go to? Or, you know, what's a mass? Yeah. How is that different yeah. from, like, going to church? Um, it just brings up the conversation in the easiest way because you're not trying to push it on anyone. You're just saying who you are. And that's just one example. And I think that just, just if you conscientiously include that and you're like, things that you talk about and live, 
you'll be amazed like how many people will be touched in little ways. Mm -hmm. One example I use, um, and it's going to be awkward because I'm a theology major and I don't do math very well, but there's about f five, 6,000 people who are um, in the American Papist Facebook group, um, just like people who have Facebook and like American Papist too. Most of those, every one of those 5,000 or 6,000 people has a couple hundred friends. Can you imagine like the web of influence you have when you multiply 5,000 by 200? Mm. I can't do the math off the top of my head, but it's Maybe up there. Right. <laughs> Everyone who has that kind of like network of friends, if all those friends know that this, you know, if, if John or Sally is a Catholic and happy, that's mm -hmm. something that just kind of overflows. And I think we forget like, Catholics live differently. We have a unique faith. We have a unique, you know, unique sources of grace. Mm -hmm. Live your life fully and do it online too. Yeah. Maybe just to even discuss what was said in the homily. Right. Maybe start a yeah, like the priest said something that really helped me that I needed right. to hear. You know, right. I think so, oftentimes like we have this idea in our culture that, you know, your faith is private and everything else about you is very public. Mm -hmm. Well, your faith should be public too because it's, as, it's more a part of you than which bands you listen to. Right. I'd hope. <laughs> <laughs> Now, be a, being an expert in, in social media, how do you see it as, how is it forming the culture? How is it changing the culture? One of my, I think it's forming it in good and bad ways. It, the bad side is that it moves very quickly and, you know, it, it doesn't as much leave time and space for sustained thought, you know, for that, that deeper level of self-knowledge and consideration that really changes our lives. One of the principles that I try to hold to is that our, you know, our online life should serve our offline life. What we do on a computer or on, a, you know, on our cell phone um, should be at the service of what we're doing, like in our real life. Like if you notice the way the sacraments work, we always have to be there for to receive the grace. You have to be at mass. You have to go to confession. You know, you wouldn't you wouldn't say that you are married to someone who lives on the other side of the world and you call once in a while and you've mm -hmm. never met in person. You know, our physical presence matters because we're body and spirit. Mm -hmm. And so one of the principles, and I spend a lot of time online, is that what I'm doing online should be serving my spiritual life and my personal life. So one, one of my, you know, laws is I don't blog on Sundays. Mm -hmm. I make exceptions once in a while and I shouldn't. Yeah. But it's just like creating that space to say that, you know, God gives us all this time. He gives us all this technology, mm -hmm. all this ways to have like entertainment and information. But what he most wants us to find in all that is him. And so if all the time you're spending all online, all the time you're spending text messaging your friends, if that's not draw drawing you close to Jesus, you've got to relook at why you're doing those other things in your life. Right. You know, I find something helpful, too, is, you know, maybe in your filter or whatever, your Internet source, just to have blocks that, you know, you can surf the web from 7 to 8 at night right. or something. Personal habits. Yeah, and I, I find like sometimes you get on and it's like four hours later, you're like, what is, you know, what happened? You know, I just, I went here, I went here, and it, right. it takes over well, your life. Well, when we go, uh, you know, God willing, when we get to the pearly gates, St. Peter isn't going to ask us, so how much time do you spend web surfing? Because that's <laughs> right. really going to put you ahead of the line. Right. No. And it can be addictive. It's so stimulating and that it, you know, everything's flashing. There's, all, there's so much good stuff to read and everything. Have you, have you met a lot of these? I mean, you report on activities in Rome and powerful figures in the church. Have you met some of these, flesh on flesh? These I, I have. I'm, I'm kind of a, um, a papist groupie, you might say. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to, I, I should start like a, a kind of a running tally of the cardinals I've been privileged to meet and, you know, receive their blessing from. I think I'm around five or six um, this year or so, which is a little bit below average. Who have um, you met? Well, let's see. I, <laughs> most recently, I had a I had a nice uh, sit down with Cardinal DiNardo, who's in charge of the U.S. Bishops' pro life activities uh, during the March for Life. Mm -hmm. I got to meet Cardinal Schönborn, who's the Archbishop of Vienna, when he was in Washington D.C. recently. Um, I've met Cardinal Maida of Detroit, who was um, in charge of the uh, Sacred Heart Seminary where I was going mm -hmm. to school, um, and I even met uh, Cardinal Ratzinger before he became Pope Benedict. Um, I was in Rome uh, for the, one of the last Masses that John Paul II said, uh, Easter Mass, I think of 2003. And my friend and I were huge Cardinal Ratzinger fans. And uh, after Pope John Paul II had gone down the aisle, we spotted Cardinal Ratzinger in the line of cardinals following him. And my friend, who's Irish and sort of has an intense personality, just as Cardinal Ratzinger was passing by us, 
sh- kind of shouted out in a tone that's not appropriate for St. Peter's, <laughs> Ratzinger rules. <laughs> and Cardinal Ratzinger kept his eyes straight forward, but we got him to crack this big smile. <laughs> so <laughs> I knew him back way back when. I heard he <laughs> nodded his head and said, that's right. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Yeah, and, you know, I like, hope that kid says some Hail Marys on the way home. <laughs> well, you know, I, I've... I've kind of fallen to that too, and it's not that I've yelled things, but that <laughs> you do kind of get like a rock star. There's an kind exuberance, of, yeah. yeah. But you know, when I when I was in Rome for the close for the year for priests, I was just absolutely thrilled, you know, to see Pope Benedict that close. And I was there like well, a lot of most of the priests were older than me, and they got excited too. You know, it wasn't like World Youth Day, but there was an excitement. And I remember he he came out. This is like right in front of St. Peter's at night, and he was taking questions from priests and things powerful but then they brought in the blessed sacrament on that altar they set up outside of the steps and and he knelt in adoration and we all prayed in adoration right and i remember it was so powerful because it's like you know this isn't about personalities no. you know this isn't about rock stars or celebrities so to speak uh we're all following jesus christ he right. is the source it's his church you know this is his vicar on earth but you know jesus is the one and i remember that was so powerful to see the pope kneeling in uh, in humble adoration such a powerful lesson well yeah so you know some of these people but how do you get most of your information when you blog I mean, how does that network go i have this um there's a there's a, a large group of people who have been reading the blog for some time that i refer to as my web elves mm-hmm. um these are people who help me find stories um and send me information and from that i kind of most of in the old days or like five years ago <laughs> uh, when I when I started my blog, I would go out and try to find stories, and I'd be clicking through, and as you said, like spend four hours and stumble yeah, upon something yeah. interesting. As as the blog developed, and as the readership grew, and as I kind of got more in the habit of writing, um, people began coming to me and saying, you know, you have a lot of people reading you. You should you should know about this great thing that's happening, you know, at Wyoming Catholic College, uh, which I know you're you're mm-hmm. going to be at. Mm-hmm. Um, we check it out. And so they already give me kind of the, the jump start to say, okay, here's a Catholic who is excited about the same things I'm excited about, and they've already shown me like kind of where to get started. So that's, that's one way where I've found my news. As I said, the nice thing about a blog is it's a two-way conversation. Um, even though in, in one sense it's just me and a computer screen and a keyboard, in another sense it's me and thousands of Catholics. Mm-hmm. And that's just an incredibly encouraging thing. One of the other nice things that I get to do is we, we can get together and pray for the same cause. Um, you know, some friend came to me recently and they had a complicated pregnancy and the, both the mother and the child were in dire straits. Well, I was able to tell my readers, well, please join me in praying for them. And so I had thousands of people praying for this cause and prayers know no distance. Right. So it's a way of kind of, again, like drawing together, you know, in Christ, in grace, online. And those comments that you post, like at the end of a blog, can be so enriching to the original article. You know, people can share their experiences or reflections and bring bring so much to it. Right, because I'm not an expert in, in all things, but right. you know, my readers are. Yeah. People who are closer to the thing can be. Right. Not not everybody, I'm sure, likes everything you write. Yeah. Out of that many. <laughs> That's fair. Gazi- <laughs> <laughs> that many gazillions of people who were reading you. Uh, what sort of feedback do you get, maybe on the flip side? Well, I think the number one thing that I encounter, and maybe this is a cop-out for me, but is, is ignorance. Is ignorance about, you know, why See, I'm... I've always said that people who don't like me, I just say that they're ignorant. No, 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 <laughs> it's not that I mean, that's, that's, Don't yeah. you think that's just the best way? It'd be? Yeah, it'd be great. It'd be great <laughs> if it was, but it's, no, it's, more, it's the deeper ignorance. It's the ignorance about not understanding the context for why I'm saying something. Right. Or not and, certain aspects of the faith right. and such. Right. Or that, I mean, we live in a culture where people don't, don't un, don't believe that you can that love can be judging, that mm-hmm. love can say that something is wrong. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, I think that's just kind of a shock factor when I when I will say you know someone's actions are hurtful and they're wrong and they should stop doing them. Well, you know, know, that's one thing that makes your blog interesting is that you're not afraid uh, to call people out to say a hard truth. And I, I think Doug's point is, I imagine that would draw a lot of fire. Is that part hard for you? I mean, 25-year-old taking criticism from... Well, it's very easy to ignore unrational criticism. It's hard to ignore true criticism. And mm-hmm. I, I, one thing that I have, I would say, developed um, is a little bit of a more explicit sense of how I'm trying to be, tr- to be truly charitable. Mm-hmm. One of the things that I, I discovered I was not doing was I would look at a situation where I strongly disagreed with someone, and I would just, on my, in my article, 
list all the reasons I, dis I disagreed in, with them. What I would forget to do was also say that I'm praying for them and that I would hope that if I made the same mistake, they would tell me. Mm -hmm. All the sorts of things that people, if they had met me in person, I would have said, but I just never thought to bring it up. And so, you know, one of the things we have to remember when we read someone online is that that's not the whole person, right. that there's other things going on. And once that step was taken, I realized, well, that's also true of the people I'm seeing online. I would say that of, of the many times that I've had people get angry back at me or send me an angry letter, I've never had a, an angry conversation with someone in person. Hmm. There's a, it's really e easy to be angry at an idea or at a picture of someone's face or half a face as it is on my website. Hmm. And what they're saying, it's really hard to get angry at another person because... That's a cool image, too. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll, some other people are starting to steal it now. I'm going to have to change it up now and <laughs> think of that, a new branding. That is a great point. I mean, because there's, there's a temptation to dehumanize and take away the, the dignity of the interaction of speaking to somebody face to face. I know. Right. And people I, should remember that, not to interrupt, but right. just people should remember that. If you aren't confident saying something that you're going to write online mm -hmm. to your f best friend face to face, yeah. don't do it. Hey, the same yeah. thing goes for texting. Yeah. Kids who text one another, people text one another, and they can be pretty harsh and, and cruel, and then they, then they get together face to face and they can act as if nothing happened. And to me, that there's, there's a, there's a right. disingenuous there that, that uh, can be very yeah. hurtful. Technology doesn't create a, f a, a zone that's free of morality because mm -hmm. you're always the one doing it, and that's what mm -hmm. you're responsible for, and that's what really you're responsible for to God. Yeah. So I think that people sometimes try to escape online. You know, they try to, like, you know, say things that they wouldn't say in person, but right. that's still them saying it, and God's going to see it, right, <laughs> you know? Right. And I've learned the power of the smiley face. You know, you <laughs> Diffuses a lot of tense <laughs> situations. <laughs> I, I mean, but first, when I first started email, and it's like you'd say something <laughs> sarcastic, you meant to be a joke, and the next thing I get this, this tome of an email back, you right. know, ripping my head off. Right. Because we're learning. Yeah. I think we're learning as a culture to figure <laughs> right. out like, how right. to use these things. Right. That's why we have emoticons. What's that? The emoticons, the little The facial. dancing happy faces that oh, you get okay. from yeah. annoying ad. You can put them on your message. That way people can get the idea whether you're being serious or cute or oh, clever okay. or whatever. Yeah. Well, we're going to take a quick break. They're telling us to break. <laughs> we'll be it's back really in a minute. <laughs> This coming weekend. Okay. So. I need to uh, make a little announcement that this coming weekend we're going to be in Canton, Ohio for our family celebration. Uh, we'll have uh, Raymond Arroyo speaking at the family event. We'll have Dr. Ray Garendi, Marcus Grodi, Mother Assumpta, and, uh, and Doug Keck, I think, will be giving a talk as well. So you want to join us there in Canton. It's free. Uh, we love to meet the people that watch this network. It, it's great for us as priests and uh, those who are who work here at EWTN. Um, Doug, you had a, a question for Well, you know, y we talk a lot about, um, you know, the power of the media and, you know, the, the kind of negative feedback that comes your way, but what sort of positive things do you see, um, maybe the, the way people are touched personally, and, I, you know, without getting into too many, you know, personal details or, or such, um, if it, you know, maybe anonymous stories you could share with us, because um, there are those, those people out there just surfing the web and all of a sudden they come upon something like a blog like this, and all of a sudden, the light bulb goes off, and they're back in the confessional again. I right. mean, do you know stories or, or, or people who have been affected positively in those ways? I think often what I'm doing is more of an intermediary role. Um, you know, you can't give what you don't have. And my life circumstances, I'm still just a young man who, you know, likes talking about things like, of this nature. What I think the, the good things that have come out of it are through connecting people and like, not only good ideas, but passionate figures. Um, one of the things I've been able to do is help struggling causes by diverting attention, like not, not diverting, but focusing attention on it. So like a, a pro-life pregnancy health center, which was, looking, which was short on funds needed to get an ultrasound machine. I was able to pull together people. One story that comes to mind was I had a pregnancy, I, I know someone who uh, you know, works at a pregnancy center, and a family came in who was having a complicated pregnancy who didn't want to seek an abortion, but at the same time, they're about to get kicked out of their apartment um, because they didn't have rent. And it was just an opportunity to say to the people who read my blog, these people 
are pro-life. They're trying to they're trying to you know live the church's teaching, but they also got to pay rent. And in a couple hours, we managed to pull together enough funds, just p- everyone pitching in like five, ten, twenty-five bucks to get them through you know that hard month. Mm. And you know I haven't heard anything more after that, but I know they got through that one month. Right. And I know that that's not because of me; it's because of the generosity of all the people who read me. And I right. think that's just a small example. You know, my father has a saying, and I'm not sure, but other people have probably said it too, that when we, ma- when we make a mistake, we hear about it often. But we rarely get to hear about the good we do. I think one of the joys of heaven will be finding out all the, the little good things we got to do to, uh, in other people's lives that we had no idea about. Sometimes, you know, 10 years down the line, someone will come and say, you know that one time we got into that fight and we were in such a, a great disagreement and I got so angry at you? Well, I never told you, but you were right. And that actually changed my life, and you were, were right about the thing. I did, you know, support my, my, my girlfriend, or, you know, I did make the right choice at work. So, you know, I think that Christians and Catholics just have to rely on the, the mercy of the Lord and, and try their best. But, um, well, but you make, I'm sorry, you make a great point, though, is that, you know, what you have here through the media, which is another reason why we Catholics should be much, much more involved you know, with the right intentions, of course, of using the media, an opportunity where, as you said, in a very short amount of time, you were able to draw enough people together to, whether it's nickel and dimes or widow's mite, whatever you want to right. call it, help out a fellow, a fellow, uh, you know, member of the faith here. I like to think that every time I've got a new reader, I've got a new little responsibility. You know, any, as, as you know, working in media, it's a great responsibility to have people watching you and seeking the truth from you. And there's been, there's certainly been circumstances where I didn't get a story quite right. And I, you know, defamed or, you know, criticized someone unfairly. Mm -hmm. That's, to me, and it should be to everyone, a really big deal Mm -hmm. that you've, you know, you know, done even unintentionally some sort of little character assassination. So, you know, I've always tried to like patch those things over quickly. But, you know, send them a smiley face. No, it's not enough. (laughs) Yeah. To start with, you know, Um, but that's the responsibility. I think that, you know, that's that's one of our constant checks of humility. Right. Is that, you know, whenever we're looking, whenever we think about like, oh my gosh, you know, so many people read this or so many people are, are going to see this show. Well, that's that many more people now that, you know, Christ has given you an opportunity right. to, you know, shape their lives. Right. So. I know you speak of, uh, and this has certainly been echoed in the, we've seen it in the secular media world, how the blogosphere and the new media has uh, leveled the playing field, so to speak. You know, right. when I was a young kid, you know, you had like CBS, NBC. You do three networks. Yeah, three networks, it. right? Yeah. And they're controlling all this stuff. And all of a sudden, you got these other voices. I think especially in terms of religion and faith, spirituality, so often uh, the secular media gets it wrong. Anytime right. they report on the church. Oh, it's horrible, yeah. <laughs> mostly. I mean, the Catholic Church is a complicated thing because it's not just a human thing. You know, and if you if you try to understand a divine supernatural reality like the church, on purely human material terms, you're gonna get you're gonna make some major mistakes. Right. Now, I absolutely agree with you that one of the great gifts we have in the church today is more of an even playing field. Mm-hmm. You know, we have EWTN. We have our own ways of conveying the truth with no filter from the outside right. world. Right. That's an incredible opportunity. That's all Catholics have ever wanted is simply an even playing field. It's often the other side that's trying to stack the deck. Right. I mean, Catholics in that sense, that's why, I mean, freedom of religion means we can practice our faith fully, which is all we want to do. Right. Um, that's a start. The other thing that I think it's helpful to keep in mind, you know, t- you know, 15 years ago we didn't have blogs. Five years ago we didn't have social media. Um, who knows what we're going to have? You know, you can, now, you can now broadcast little television things from your phone. It's, it's still rudimentary. Mm-hmm. But throughout all of this, though, um, the world is getting very good at conveying data, at conveying information. Mm-hmm. It's not good at conveying wisdom. Mm-hmm. And that's what people are actually looking for. I mean, John Paul II has that wonderful line, and I can't quote, quote it precisely, but he says, you know, out of this myriad of computer screens and this galaxy of images, will the face of Christ emerge? And that's why Catholics shouldn't lose heart when they see, like, how many different media and new media and web portals and, you know, Mm -hmm. all these things that are happening. Because the Catholic who is a Christ bearer, the the Catholic who brings the presence of Christ and the truth as, you know, formulated and carried on by his church has got something that no one else has. So even if you just are talking to your friends in the supermarket, which is my favorite Mm -hmm. example because that's mostly where I seem to, like, bump into people who want to talk about their faith— um, or, you know, using my blog or social network mm-hmm. or being on EWTN, 
it's like that's an opportunity to, to give what I uniquely have, to give that gift. You know, one of the things that, that seems to be coming through a lot of what you're saying, Thomas, is that with regards to, you know, the media in general and people who are going to be active in this, because everybody and their dogs got a video up on, on YouTube, it seems like now. Right. You know, you want to get a video of your, yourself jumping off a roof onto a table or something, and it, they've done it. Yeah. You know, but there, there needs to be a sense of responsibility, as you mentioned, wisdom, um, you know, the purpose of trying to bring Christ to the world. Um, it, not doing it for the sake of doing it, but doing it with the intention that is truly going to benefit mankind and help seek the salvation of souls. And that seems to be coming through a lot, I hear, in what you're saying. And that, I think, should be a key message to get out to everybody watching and listening right now, is that the sense of responsibility, whether mm-hmm. you're texting someone or whether you're, you're, you're writing a blog for the world to hear. Right. I mean, we have the sense that, you know, it's not fair to be opinionated about your faith, to have, you know, to have opinions. But we have opinions about everything. We have opinions about what the best sports team is, what the best soft drink is, you know, what the best brand of computer is. You know, there's a charitable way that we can have that same opinion about our faith. You know, my faith is wonderful because it's true, because it provides for my needs, because it provides answers to these questions. You know, it's just gradually creating that habit of mind Mm -hmm. of including your faith at the first step at the same level that you include your other opinions and then of course going so much farther but it's just reaching that first level I think after that point after you start working with Christ he takes you the rest of the way well we have a couple of emails Uh, brother Matthew can you uh, read one for us yes father dear Mr. Peters you are so great at spreading Catholicism and good morals and making it well cool (laughs) <laughs> Since you are very good at this, are there any ways that we can make morals cool in our everyday interactions? Do we have to explicitly tell our friends God is awesome? Thank you, Danny C., age 13. Hmm. Well, that's a good start. God is awesome. <laughs> um, I guess he's talking about showing or telling, right? Or... Yeah, I mean, making morals cool. The best witness is a happy life lived with integrity. Just as when you're talking about um, you know, watching JP2 kneel in adoration of the Blessed Sacrament. As a, as a man, my, you know, as a man, I look at that and I see this is a man with integrity who is so full of the love of God that he's on his knees and it's hard for him. And, you know, that's the, ins- that's, that's the witness. You know, I think whenever we complain that, you know, our friends aren't instantly converted whenever we say Jesus Christ is Lord, part of that reason could be because when they look at us, do we live our lives as if Jesus Christ is Lord? Mm-hmm. The number one argument we have for our faith is our lives. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's really hard to listen to someone who's telling you to do what they don't even really seem to be doing very well themselves. So it's just, you know, it's a constant work. Um, but, uh, you know, as I, as I would like to say, you know, Catholics throw the best parties. Catholics <laughs> have the most fun because it's a fun that dips into the eternal. The right. sort of things that I do that I enjoy are part of a complete vision of life that's been given to me by God, which isn't going to end. And so much, of, so much of, I think, kids my age are looking to have so much fun because they think they've only got one shot at it in this life. Yeah. And don't you think that there's a misunderstanding between really what fun is and what peace is? Or right. joy. True joy. Yeah. You know, I mean, St. Augustine says, you know, when it comes to, you know, um, true peace is found in the order of, of being in, that, in the presence of God. And that, that that peace that everybody is seeking gets, gets misunderstood as being fun and right. excitement and being cool. And true coolness, if you want to call it that, is true peace. And true peace is found even in the midst of trials. Uh, St. Maximilian Colby, was he at peace as he was laying his life down? I'm sure he was because he was in the order of Christ, yeah. even though he was in a concentration camp dying. Well, right. let's, uh, let's try to get one more email in. Dear Thomas, it was recently announced that the Vatican will be redesigning their website, finally. Thomas, have you, have you had any offers to be the, pap- the official paper- papist blogger? Smiley face. You got about Andrew 40, Bremerton, Washington. 45 seconds. 45 seconds? <laughs> no, they haven't, and I'm still waiting. My, you know, my, my email is on the website. You can check it out. Send me an email. Um, I, I think it's great news that the Vatican mm-hmm. is updating their website, yeah. um, but I think it's absolutely proper that the Vatican has its website and I have mine, and we can both read each other's. Right. Well, thank you so much uh, for joining <laughs> us. Thank you. It's been a, a great show. We forgot to ask you, too. you got maybe 30 seconds. Okay. What, what drives you? Tell us about your personal faith. Uh, In 30 in seconds. In 30, 30 seconds? seconds. Yeah. <laughs> this is the new well, media. Well, you as do Danny it. C. said, God is awesome, you better and, not more, have, and more people need to hear about it. You better it. not leave your, your, your girlfriend out. 
and I have a girlfriend, so right. <laughs> that's, the, that's, the, that's the last second bombshell. <laughs> okay, well, I want to encourage all our young people to be out there in the, in the new media, no, new social media, to bear witness to Christ, uh, to bear witness to your life with Him, your love for Him, your friendship with Him, and certainly stay connected with one another. So thank you, thank you so, so much. much. Uh, My for pleasure. Being on the show. Uh, the Lord be with you. And also, also with, with you. you. May our Heavenly Father shine His face upon you and give you His peace. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We'll see you next week.